Hey folks, it's Matt Zachary, and welcome to Vax On, a weekly segment of my podcast, Out of Patience, right here on the Offscript Network. Hey, I'm Alura Nanos. I'm a lawyer, a journalist, a mom of a teenage narcoleptic, and a professional big mouth. Lou and I go back 30 years as best friends, and we're here to have fun and bring you a layperson's guide to what the hell just happened this week in healthcare as America gets its vax on and shows COVID the door. We're here together to learn, complain, and include you in the conversation. So join us on Twitter at VaxOnPod and share your stories and grievances using the hashtag VaxOn. All right, Matt, let's get at it. We're back. It's Vax on. Hello, Elora. Hello, Matt. I'm in a great mood right now. Say that again. Those are not words that come out of your mouth. I know. I'm in a great mood right now, but I'm, I'm going to predict that it's only going to last until the second segment where I'm going to get wildly <laughs> irate. Okay. Fantastic. Okay. I'd like it to go on record. I'm in a fabulous mood right now. Um, it is Lunar New Year, which I just love. And we already have some delicious Chinese vittles upstairs waiting for us for dinner while we watch, I don't know, something Asian themed that my kids picked out. I love a themed dinner. You're the tiger. We, it's the year of the tiger. Yeah. And, like, I love that. I also love that Lunar New Year is like a thing now that the whole world appears to be celebrating. About time, too. It's a big deal. And because it's Lunar New Year, my school district gave everyone the day off. And they didn't say it was because of Lunar New Year. They were like, happy Lunar New Year. And also it's a teacher in service. But we had the day off. They did that here in Brooklyn. Too. My kids are off. And as we're taping, my daughter's in the other studio working and talking to her friends. Oh, New York was off also? Yes, we were. I didn't know that. Hi, Hannah. Had I known that, I would have invited you to come with me today. That would have been fun. But I had to come to the office and work. I know. I, for well, you people, I, I, you listeners, I do this for you. <laughs> I was uh, working in a manner of sorts that in that I had a car full of middle school girls um, and I took them, uh, what is it called, snow tubing um, in the Poconos for the day. That sounds amazing. I, I have uh, nothing but envy for you having had that day and I didn't. But from a pandemic perspective, it was pretty packed. Um, you know, from a pandemic, I, I was actually at this exact same tubing place last year, right around this time. And it was mobbed last year. Really? Um, but I think I went on a Saturday. And this time it was, you know, there were people, but I wouldn't say it was mobbed. And I was so thrilled to be doing something that was so COVID safe because we were outside the whole time. Right. And it was like, I don't know, just kind of like no stress. I mean, everyone we were with is, you know, is vaxxed and, and everybody's good. Everybody's health is good right now. But, um, you know, it's always kind of that little extra layer of anxiety. So when you're doing something outside, it just feels like, oh, good. Okay. I don't have to worry so much. Yeah. I just have to worry about, you know, orthopedic injuries. On right. the <laughs> <laughs> we don't have data on whether COVID gets really cold and goes away when it's freezing. Oh, we don't know that? I I'm, I'm making up data that doesn't exist. Can you make it up? Because in, in my mind, if I'm feeling uncomfortably cold, I'm not worrying about COVID. All right, fine. Under 32, COVID's dead. <laughs> yeah. Dr. Matt has spoken. Yeah. I mean, this may, this is based on absolutely nothing, but um, only in that- no, I heard I it on Joe worry. Rogan. <laughs> we'll talk about him later when I get irate. <laughs> That's for later. Do you have an update for me, by the way? I have surprisingly no COVID update, and maybe that's a good problem to have. There's been no drama COVID-related in my family or in my life since we taped last week. That's wonderful. I'm I'm happy for you to be COVID drama-free. In fact, I would really like to adopt some sort of greeting or farewell that means I wish you a week free of COVID drama. I, wouldn't that be nice? You know, uh greeting or or adieu that <laughs> bon can, we, can we get on that can, you know bombini, the, bombini's how they say hello and goodbye in aruba yeah like you know how like when you call like best buy they're like good afternoon best buy where <laughs> you know <laughs> dvd players are two for one like i would like something like that's just like good afternoon i really hope COVID hasn't fucked up your life this week let's channel demolition man with the be well john spartan and that's our <laughs> greeting for for may you be COVID free Yes, I like that. I'd forgotten that aspect of it altogether. But yes. You well, John Spartan is the new we hope you're not fucked up by COVID this week. Yes. I, I hope that catches on. Listeners, I leave it to you. Be well, John Spartan. <laughs> Do you know this about me, Matt? That there are certain movies that I love, certain kinds of movies. And one genre of movie that I universally love is any movie that takes place in an enclosed space. Really? <laughs> like movies and submarines. Like aliens? Movies in prison. 
Yeah, Alien is not one of my Under favorite Siege, because here's the problem. Hunt for Red October. Yeah, Hunt for Red October. Okay. I, love, I hate space movies, so nothing in space, but I like closed spaces. The it's cave? Like the opposite of claustrophobia. <laughs> Like House of Wax, the game. Yeah, like I like anything where the whole thing takes place in the same location. Reservoir Dogs. Like, yeah, yes, I love Reservoir Dogs. Okay. Like, I, I guess really what it is is low budget movies. I don't know. Um, but anything that takes place, the whole thing in a bus, the whole thing in a plane. Like I, Con Air, love that movie. Like love Air Force One. I don't know. It's like a weird thing. <laughs> Airplane 2, the sequel. I, lo- I watched Airplane with my kids two weeks ago. They were like, we don't get this. And I'm like, shut up. It's funny. It's aged so well and yet it hasn't. What's your vector vector? It's great. Okay, so I, here's what I have to talk to you about for our first segment because, you know, I like to think of myself as relatively on the pulse of of not so much pop culture but kind of like pop news culture. Okay. And I completely missed this. So you have to tell me if you know about this. Are you aware of the situation with Novavax? That's a made-up name. Okay, good. So you're not – So That's like so, people just stitched other things together to invent a company. Right. That sounds, it sounds like a movie pharmaceutical company. It sounds like a really bad Carl Sagan ripoff on PBS. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Like, just, I can almost see, like, welcome to Novavax on GBS with Bob Sagan, <laughs> Carl's brother. Carl's brother. You never heard of me, <laughs> but I know stuff yes. about the stars. You know, that, that is true. It really does seem like a made up name, but apparently it's a real company. It's based in Maryland. And here's the sitch. So they have a COVID vaccine. Who knew? And it's not available yet in the U.S. It's it is available in um, like Australia and India and a couple of other countries. But here's what's happening: people are getting like obsessed with it because it looks like the data looks really good. Like the efficacy rate is ninety point four percent, depending on the variant. And what what has happened is that there's these thousands of people that are like devoted followers of Novavax on social media. And we're calling them Nova stands, which is so funny to me. They ha- it, like this vaccine has like this weird cult like following and people are traveling to other countries because they want to get the Novavax v- vaccine in particular. Are these people that haven't yet got vaccinated or they're waiting for like their boosters and they only want this one? You know, it sounds like some of these people are waiting for the Novavax vaccine. They're holding out, hoping that that it's going to be available in the U.S. soon. And and people are saying that this is going to become kind of like what happened with GameStop because it's being hyped online, ah. that it's going to become like an investment opportunity also. The Tesla of vaccines. Yes, yes. It's like the Tesla of vaccines. And I don't exactly know how to feel about it. I sort of think it's funny. Um there's a part of me that sort of loves that people are becoming fans of a certain vaccine. Um, there's something that I, I love about that. On the other hand, it seems bizarre. So I, I, I'm conflicted in terms of my emotions. What do you think? I don't even know how to process this. You know, fanboying or fangirling over a vaccine company just makes it's weird. I mean, I, 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 Johnson & Johnson getting in the game, everyone's like, but you make baby powder, right? What are you doing in the mix? And here's a company no one's ever heard of. Bringing up the rear as the <laughs> says me Tesla <laughs> vaccine companies that has a fan base. But I guess I don't I'm know. Look at what happened with look at what happened with Tesla. Like they weren't Chevy, and then like everybody loves them, and it's just such an interesting kind of psychological phenomenon, isn't it? You know, at the end of the day, if it means that more people are actually going to get vaccinated, that's kind of all I care about. No, and and I think that's really fair, right? Because that is the most important point. Um, it just the whole thing cracks me up. But at the same time, as I'm sort of chuckling at the Nova stands, I can't help but have this nagging sense that I'm not far behind them because I saw what happened with the booster, right? So I, I, my initial shots were Moderna shots, just like yours, right? Yes, and. When we got the initial shot, they said, okay, whatever you got the first time, you have to get the same one the second time because it was a different amount of time in between them. Then when the booster shots came out, they said, you could just get whichever booster shot. It doesn't really matter. And I totally waited the extra like three weeks or however long it was until the Moderna shot came out for a, for a booster. Oh, wait, I'm, I'm seeing, I'm, I'm getting something in my earpiece that doesn't exist. Novavax is not an mRNA vaccine, which means it does not have the Bill Gates microchip. So that's why people care about it. I just picked this up and I'm reading this verbatim that a professor of psychology at the University of, I'm going to mispronounce this on purpose, Guelph in Canada, 
That sounds like okay. a terrible name for a Guelph. city. I'm sorry, Guelph. <laughs> Not a. That sounds like a. I got the Guelph. Oh, help me out. This is the, the episode where we complain about what everyone names everything. <laughs> yes, <laughs> that there's enough sentiment, especially in Canada, that the mRNA vaccines have sparked vitriol and skepticism because it's a newer technology that people are unfamiliar with. Well, I mean, which is largely the same thing we're seeing here is that, you know, I think that the fact that it was a newer technology did contribute to this like wide scale anti-vax feeling that so many people share or, you know, so much skepticism about what it is and yeah, how but, it works. And but what that's it does. a load of bullshit because mRNA technology has been around for like 15 years. Right. So, and you know, I, but guess, I mean, I, at the same time, yeah, it's been around, but regular people who are not, you know, really involved with the medical world just heard of it just now, right? Yeah. Just recently because of COVID. Yeah. So, you know, it, there's always that question, is it actually new or is it just new to you because you just heard about it yesterday? I don't and, like um, change. <laughs> <laughs> it's, I mean, it's, it's, everyone has that relative, right? Who right. like, they come to Christmas dinner and they're like, hey, did you hear about this, the latest thing? And it's like something from five years ago. Right. You're like, you know, there's these things, the iPads. Speaking of which, have you heard of Fuller House on Netflix? Oh, I thought we weren't supposed to talk about Full House this month. Oh, God. R.I.P. Bob Saget. That's right. R.I.P. Bob Saget. Did you read Stamos's eulogy? Oh, my goodness. It was fantastic. So touching. Had me in tears. So touching. Incredible oh, writing. Man. Great, great, Absolutely. great I, post. It, it made, I didn't think I could love John Stamos more, and then it happened. Um, But yeah, so Novavax, you know, folks, you heard it here first. I don't know. Invest in it. Get it. I don't know. Get it. Get on board with these people that think it's. I don't know. I think it's just kind of a funny thing to follow. Um, but hey, look, I'm all for any vaccine that has a 90 percent effective rate. It's not as if mRNA vaccines are the only vaccines worth ever using. So you know, I, I mean, sure, if it works, I guess. Right. But so that's a good way to kick off the show because you started with the fact that you're in a good mood. So let's slowly descend into madness <sighs> with our second segment. I, I want I, I want to hurt these people. OK, <laughs> I, Matt, I can't stand this entire line of information. Here's what's going on. Well, I, put your lawyer hat on, right? Your lawyer uh, rage hat on. Rage. So four South Carolina lawmakers proposed a bill to make it a crime to ask someone's vaccination status. How does that even, how is that even a thing with free speech? Indeed, which is like even the least of the issues, right? But like, it, 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 this is maddening. So we have seen this in lots of states, not, not making it a crime, but we have seen making it illegal, civilly illegal for, for example, a business to, ask someone's vaccination status. Florida tried to do this or, or did it. Texas did it. Um, and basically what this is, is like an anti-vaccine passport move. You know, it, it's it's saying no one is allowed to make their business choices based on who is vaccinated and who is not vaccinated. And all of this, whether you make it a crime or a civil offense or something that's just prohibited or whatever, all of this comes down to this kind of core belief that people think that it is somehow illegal or immoral to treat vaccinated people differently from unvaccinated people. And the word for that, that we use in the law, when you treat one group of people differently from another group of people, the word for that is discrimination. And discrimination can be legal or illegal. So like an example of legal discrimination is that we do not allow children into casinos and strip clubs. We, we separate it by age. So it is still discrimination, meaning we treat different people different ways, but it is not illegal because illegal discrimination is only in situations where the, the factor that we use to you know, have different standards is a race-based factor, religion-based, national origin, legitimacy. Um, so you know, we have you know, gender, we have this list of things that you're not, those are no-nos. But, you know, you might have noticed that certainly vaccine status is not on that list. So is this a stunt? Because clearly this will not pass any sniff test with like the ACLU and free speech and whatnot. Or are, are, the, are these guys doing this just for the, the PR to look like they are living on one side of the aisle? I, I mean, I, I guess so. 
um, because I don't see them holding up. But you have to understand that the way that this is being done is that it is forbidding the discrimination. So it's saying you would have been allowed to make this choice about who you do business with, but we're telling you, you actually can't make that choice. So it becomes a different type of legal analysis. And I won't belabor it because it is kind of complicated, but essentially it's saying maybe we would have made a, a law that said you have to have a vaccine to go in a restaurant, but we're just going to come in there and circumvent the entire process and say everyone has to be treated treated the same. And what it opens the floodgates legally up for is someone saying, you're putting me at risk by f- essentially forcing me to be around unvaccinated people. And you're taking the freedom of choosing who they're doing business with away from business owners. And that's really the problem here is that you're basically saying you don't really have freedom of contract. You don't really have you know, the right to make these decisions. It, you're not even allowed to ask people their vaccination status. Is Lindsey Graham involved with this? Actually, no, because this is this is he's a senator, and this, oh, this is the was, house. Uh, yeah, this is the, and I think these are state lawmakers. Okay, I, these are not federal lawmakers. You know, I mean, and and they're doing it in uh, the employment context. They're saying like employers can't ask employees, but you know that's sort of a crazy thing to say in, in my book because it's saying even if the employer wants to have a really COVID safe policy, they're not even allowed to have it, which is nuts to me. So are they conflating this? I'll put my cancer hat on. The employers cannot ask you if you had cancer during like an interview? Uh, I, I mean, I guess. And I think that it's very easy to think of it the same way. But in reality, it's completely different because whether somebody had cancer is completely irrelevant to the health of the people around them. True. So, you know, there's good reason for that to say, well, we don't want to discriminate based on a disability. You know, if it has nothing to do with your ability to for- perform the job, it, it really is not relevant to the interview process. But that's very different than a contagious disease during a public health emergency. Right. Do you currently have Ebola? <laughs> like, and to say that you couldn't ask is just like so nuts to me. Yeah. Uh, you know, because it's really prioritizing what they think are the rights of I don't know, people with COVID, people who are unvaccinated, whatever, uh, prioritizing those people over the right to an employer to keep the workplace healthy. And and that that is just mind-numbing to me. I'm always amazed at how state and local governments can force private sectors to do things that are in the disinterest of the economy. Yeah. I mean, and the, if you think about it, a lo- so much of this is just about making local headlines for the purpose of getting local votes and having people think that these these lawmakers are fighting for their rights in some way. And it's like not even real. You know, something like this is a perfect example. It's not good for the economy. It's not good for the local businesses. It's not good for anyone. But it may be good for the politicians themselves because – It's a stunt. You know, it's, it, right, it's like a stunt. And I mean, and who knows where this will go. But um, yeah, I mean, it's the kind of thing that like to someone who has – you know, agrees with this line of thinking, it resonates with them. So then they like that politician, regardless of the fact that the law behind it makes absolutely no sense. All right. Well, hashtag South Carolina, and we'll be right back after some ads. Has your chronic illness made it difficult to continue working in the traditional way? Want to learn how to find and create flexible remote work that both accommodates your chronic illness and generates an income? Join the Patients Getting Paid membership, a community of chronicpreneurs where people just like you find workshops and trainings, weekly updated condition-specific gigs, twice-monthly coaching calls, co-workings, accountability, and the kindest community to support you on your path to make money while working from anywhere and taking good care of yourself. Learn more or join us at patientsgettingpaid.com. All right, let's kick off with our Sir Moment poll of the week. And I'm fascinated by the answer to particularly the first question, Lou. What do we got? So we just wanted to kind of you know, take the temperature, as it were, for what's happening with COVID these days. And we asked the doctors, what are you seeing right now in terms of symptoms? And, uh, you know, as you might guess, Matt, it's all over the place. But we we do see 28% flu-like symptoms, which is what we're hearing. Right. Um, However, 13% pneumonia. That's kind of high on uh, pneumonia is a pretty serious condition. Yeah. 
Uh, you're getting 18% upper airway disease. 17% had a fever, which to me is lower than I would have expected. Right. And then only 7% lost the taste and smell. And I'm, that makes me so mad because <laughs> this is so crazy. But like in, you know, in the early days of COVID, I was, I, I sort of was comforted in a weird way that that was a major symptom because it allowed me to say like, oh, that's definitely COVID or that's definitely not COVID. And now at 7%, it's like, who cares about that symptom at all? Well, that was COVID classic. This is like new right. COVID now. <laughs> that's right. Uh, I love that. Um, and our second question, um, w which this pisses me off, is there a shortage of COVID tests and long lines for testing in your area? 80% of the doctors said, yes, there's a shortage of COVID tests in their area. That sucks. Well, let's remind the listeners that Cermo is a network of 1.3 million doctors from around the world. So we don't have any specific geographic data on where these shortages are, but it is a general average of all the responses. Yeah. And, and even if we're talking about all over the world, 80%, that's terrible. And testing is so important. And I just feel like I hate that statistic so much. In case that wasn't bad enough, we have an even worse statistic. We asked, are you experiencing hospital staffing shortages due to COVID? And 89% said yes, hospital staffing shortage. That's terrifying. Yeah, I think I understand now why we we started off happy at the top of the show and we're slowly descending into rage. This is so not happy. And, and since we're not happy, it's time to talk about Joe Rogan. Yeah, this will be fun. I, ha I have my thoughts and opinions on this, but I genuinely understand why this has become a thing. I mean, it's not like traditional outrage culture where like, Al Franken did something in the 80s that was dumb and the, he, he quit the Senate because of it. That's just fucking stupid. But this is, you know, Joe Rogan didn't come out and say, I, you know, wore blackface in the 70s. This is not that. It's just something very akin to a narrative we're very familiar with these days. Right. I in, mean, in, in, this is really more real because this is current, ongoing and dangerous, you know, in a way that that those other examples you said are just, you know, so nothing in comparison, but this is like serious business. Um, you know, Joe Rogan, he's got, he's got a show on Spotify and it, you know, he's a, he's a disinformation spreader and it's, it's purposeful. You know, it, he knows who he resonates with. He knows who wants to listen and he's spewing COVID related nonsense. In defense of Joe Rogan, how different is he from anything Rush Limbaugh would have done in a much less worse way? Well, you know, I, I agree. Probably not that different. Um, you know, there's lots of hateful people out there saying lots of stupid shit. Um, I, I will say when it comes to vaccine misinformation, it's kind of more acute, you know, it's more directed at a specific topic during a major crisis. So in that way, I do think it's a little bit different. Um, but I think that people like Rush Limbaugh and other, you know, white supremacists and people like that, like they are dangerous. It's just sort of more general uh, the way that they're dangerous. But quite frankly, I mean, I wouldn't have any problem if a platform decided to remove some of those people either. I think the issue here was that Spotify just had a kind of a completely laissez-faire attitude about what was happening on its platform. And they're entitled to do that if they want to. I mean, it took Jack Dorsey at Twitter like a year and a half to start putting like clarification warnings on certain people tweeting things that made no sense and were a, a endangerment to the public welfare. Right. Well, and, and here's the thing. I totally understand from a business standpoint that these platforms cannot be in the business of policing Every single person that says anything or writes anything or posts anything, that is, they're not in that business. They're in the business of having a platform and then being relatively hands-off about the platform. I understand that. Um, because if they had the responsibility of monitoring every single thing that went on their platform, it would be completely unmanageable. And these platforms wouldn't even be able to exist anymore in any kind of a cost-effective way. So I do get that. Um, but it, in my mind, what I like about this whole situation with Spotify is that this is how a boycott is supposed to work. You know, this is the free market taking care of itself. Right. Because you had a business that really didn't have any rules and it didn't have to have rules and that was fine. And then you had, you know, individual consumers and suppliers, you know, you had Bruce Springsteen and Neil Young saying, no, you're taking my stuff off. 
by doing that, it raised awareness to Spotify's users. And very quickly, the Spotify as a business responded and said, oh, all right, we, we have to adopt a policy here. And, you know, and, and to some degree, get our hands in something that we think is dangerous. So, it, you know, the circle closed very quickly. And I think that in that way, it is a win for free market forces working for good, doing what they're supposed to do. All right, I understand this. So like you're getting a Holocaust denier to speak at a university and they want to give that guy or that woman a, a platform because it's free speech and that's what universities do. And, th and then the college campus says, no, they can't come here because we disagree with them, which is the very definition of irony and stupidity on free speech. But are you trying to basically articulate that when it jeopardizes the public health welfare of a society, it's a completely different slant? I do. I agree. I think that that it is different in the way that it is targeted medical disinformation during a time when we need that information to be accurate. Um, I also think it's important that it's we're not talking about opinion speech. We're really talking about factually provable speech. And I think that that makes it important. You know, it's the law treats things like opinions and commentary very different than it treats factual information. And, you know, targeted disinformation is really dangerous. But I mean, the thing is, Spotify could could come out with a policy that says no one's allowed to say yellow on its platform. And that would be fine, too, because this is a private business and it has no obligation to allow full sp free speech rights to anyone. So I think this is a company that has, you know, a wise policy. Um, if Spotify was too restrictive with its rules, that might have free market consequences as well. There are plenty of people that think Facebook and Twitter are too restrictive and they have every right to think that they have every right to go elsewhere. But I think that, you know, the bottom line is it's, it's a private business doing what it has to do to keep its business looking good and working well for people. And I think it did, it made the right move for the right reason here. I often wonder that what, like, what what Twitter did, especially during the election last year, by putting those caveats up that please try to read the article before you retweet this, or this tweet may contain disinformation or misleading information. I really wonder how effective that actually is, or they're just doing it because it gets them off the hook legally. Well, they're not on the hook legally because there's, you know, Section 230 of the Communications Act, which is like a big hot topic, especially for conservatives. It, they're already protected. They're not no. They're not liable for someone else spreading, whether it's defamatory speech or misinformation. They're already not liable. Well, maybe I so didn't they don't mean. Maybe I didn't mean legally. Maybe it's just reputationally. Then, if this is like um, crisis communications, hey, look, we did this. Please stop hating yeah. us. I think very much that that is what is that it's kind of like a public relations response to something where it's kind of like they have to do something, but they're not interested in having to police everyone. So this is like a nice compromise. And and I actually think that that stuff did go a long way and, and continues to go a long way. If for no other reason, then when you see the same relatives or friends and in your scroll, you know, in your feed and as you're scrolling, you say, oh, you know what, Uncle Joe Every other post that he that he puts out there has this warning. He must be somebody who is not credible. And I think that because I would see people like that where it's like every single time they posted something, it was like the bullshit meter went off. And if you're somebody who's not really savvy, you might not realize it on your own. But if you see that over and over, you will start to see a picture coalesce. And I think that it is an important tool to kind of crafting and, and interpreting what's going on in social media feeds. Who then becomes the arbiter of preventing misinformation on a radio show? Does Spotify need a medical advisory committee to approve every single thing Joe Rogan says now? Yeah, I agree. I think that that's, that is a problem, especially for the business, right? Because it's kind of like, how, how much do they have to do? But I think, again, in this case, I think the free market took care of it on its own because they, you know, basically all of these market forces alerted Spotify, hey, this guy is really a problem. And they didn't need to sift through his stuff with a fine tooth comb because it was right there on the surface and it was really obvious. So my sense is, no, they're not going to do that. They're not going to sift through, you know, if we say something and, and you know, we make one statement and it's false, they're probably not going to come and and shut us down because of one statement. They're probably not looking that closely. I mean, we're we're not doing that, but but I'm just saying, like, I, I don't think it's going to work like that. I think that it will continue to work just like it did with Rogan, which is he became famous as a disinformation spreader, 
So, you know, it was, it was cumulative. It was so much bad information that they couldn't look away anymore. And I, I, my sense is those are the people that they're going to take down. His response, I read it before we started taping, was very like, I'm just an idiot that wants to have conversations. That was, I mean, that was his response. I, I just like to talk to people was the gist of his response. I mean, uh, would you expect anything better than that? No. Th- that's like the ultimate irresponsible comment. Right. Like it's not real. I'm just doing this. I'm just having a conversation. I'm just asking questions. None of it's real. Like that's such bullshit, because if you are a professional communicator and you can't stand behind what you say and the platform you give to, for, to guests, then, then you shouldn't be in this business, because if you don't care enough about what you're doing to say that it's real, I, I don't think you belong here. And descent into madness complete. And and as we said, now I'm in a bad mood. <laughs> Look, luckily, my Chinese food is waiting for me upstairs, and I'm going to get right back into Lunar New Year mode, like well, a tiger. We wish our listeners a happy Lunar New Year. It is the year of the tiger, and according to Wikipedia, the tiger is the third of the twelve year cycle of animals which appear in the Chinese zodiac related to the Chinese calendar. The year of the tiger is associated with the earthly branch symbol which is hopefully wellness for the planet, which is something we really need these days. Is that right? It's it's associated with wellness for the planet? The earthly branch symbol. Yes. Oh, that makes me happy. Oh, we're back. We're okay, back to happy? we're back. I love that. I was hoping that it was like the year of the tiger and the tiger in ancient Chinese mythology means the end of a pandemic. <laughs> <laughs> How timely. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Wonderful. Well, on that note, we went from happy too rageful, back to happy. <laughs> Quite a parabola. Yeah. <laughs> to the calculus books. All right, friends. We'll see you next week right here on Vaxon. Bye, Allura. Bye, Matt. That's all for now. If you like Vaxon, be sure to subscribe, leave a review on Apple Podcasts, follow us on social, and tell all your friends to listen. Tell us your shit show of a healthcare story by leaving a message for us at 855-AUDIO-66, and we might just use it in a future show. Vaxon is a product of Offscript Health. We are a healthcare engagement company built for patients and caregivers by patients and caregivers. Our executive producers are Matthew Zachary and Andrew McDowell. Our senior producer is Brianna Seely. Our hosts are Matthew Zachary and Alora Nanos. It is recorded, mixed, and edited by Brianna Seely. For advertising and media inquiries, email media at offscriptnot.com. That's media at offscript.com. For more information, visit offscript.com.